we are discussing about different microarray based platforms and how to perform some biological applications on these chips. In last lecture, M. S. Apurva Venkate showed you how to perform a microarray experiment using serum samples obtained from patients who are suffering from falciparum or Vivax malaria. Today we are going to continue the demonstration and also show you the ways to do data normalization and how to do microarray data analysis. Specifically, if your goal was to look for a biological question of interest. In this case, we are going to talk about several ways of how to make meaningful data from the patients who are suffering from malaria using protein microarray based platforms. So, let us have this lecture and demonstration session today. I am Apurva Venkatesh, your TA for this course and today we are going to talk about uh, microarray data normalization and analysis. So, in the last lecture we were trying to profile humoral responses of malaria positive patients using microarray technology. So, we are going to start from there. What we are going to do today is to see how to normalize microarray data using Excel. So, what we will do is we will start with the raw file you get from the microarray scanner, right. So, once you take your slide and you scan it in a scanner, you will extract the raw data and here is the Excel sheet you see. This is the type of data you get. I am showing you this for one particular slide. So, I will just like to repeat that one slide can probe 8 patient serum. So, here in this one particular Excel which you see here, we actually have data for 8 patients. So, first what I am going to show you is how to reorganize this data. Okay. So, let us see first of all what kind of parameters are exported. Now, you will see that all important parameters are provided in this Excel. For example, start with pixel size is 10. The slide was scanned at a wavelength of 635 nanometer. Then you go down normalization method. This was not normalized yet. So, it says none. Then if you scroll down further, you can see the PMT gain which is 400, scan power 100, laser power 1.34. So, basically later on if you want to go back and check these slides again if, if for example inst for, for instance if you forget the parameters you used you can always go and open this excel to see what you had done right so now let's scroll down further you will see block column and row so this is very important uh, again let's go back to the slide layout one slide can probe eight patient sera and one particular pad that is one pad which probes one patient sera has four blocks. So, which means that if I keep scrolling down, so every four blocks represents one patient data, right. So, then when I keep scrolling down and I go to block 5, a new patient uh, begins. So, that is what I am going to talk to you about how to reorganize this. So, for example, if you, if you see here, 4 ends here, right, with blank and you will see that there is an IgG1 IgG mix 1 which starts again. So, this is basically your new patient. So, what we are going to do is we are going to first reorganize this, but before this let me tell you which are the columns which are important for us. So, now I am going to scroll back up and we are going to go through the columns which we have on this excel. So, now apart from block, column, row, the name and the id, basically this is your protein id, we do not need any of the other columns except for column AH. So, you see column AH here. So, this is basically your F635 median minus B635 which is your basically your background signals right. So, this is our the column which we actually extract and use for an analysis and we do not need any other column here. So, what I am going to do? I am going to first delete all unwanted columns to make this excel less complicated. So, let us delete all of this and then we go and delete this as well. We also do not need these parameters for the analysis, I am also going to delete this. So, finally, this is what you get. So, now you keep scrolling down and then you arrange all patients side by side. So, when you do that, this is what you get. So, you also see that there are additional columns here, this is what you get from your GAL file. And uh, when you scroll right, 
you'll see that you all the patients are now placed next to each other right so this is the kind of excel you get first now what i'm going to do is i'm going to reorganize this excel to make it easier this is combined data for all your patients and now we'll reorganize the proteins so as you'll see the proteins are present in the same order as they are present in your slide so what we we'll first do is now that this is common data for all patients we have already put them together we're going to bring the igg mix from all four blocks together so i will repeat this slide layout once more now you have six igg mix here this is present in your block 1 similarly you have the same spots present in all four blocks of the same pad so what i'm trying to do here i'm trying to get all the igg mix together so you'll have 24 such spots one after the other we'll also do the same thing for your anti human igg mix and similarly we're also going to do the same thing for your next spots so when we rearrange our excel this is how your excel will look what i've done here i've put all the 24 igg mix of one pad together right we'll go through all the columns once more for example these are all just your um, spot details now we'll go to your adi spot id which is your gal file so this is what you get from your gal file i'll come to this in a minute before that let's talk about orf so this column here is basically your id this is also going to give you details about the fragment which has been printed on the chip so let's go to plasma db id Now, if you look at plasma DB ID, these are all basically each and every protein has a unique plasma DB ID. So that's what is mentioned in this column here. If you go to the next column, which is ORF fragment, so this will explain your ORF, uh, your column H better. If you go here, you will see that this specifies which exon segment is printed on the chip. So basically, as you know, spots which are pr printed on the chip were not purified proteins; they were IVTT spots. and basically not uh, so what is ibtt in vitro transcription translation so what was expressed the whole protein was not expressed here only a certain segment of a particular exon of a protein was expressed right so basically it's not really right to say that proteins were expressed on, on the chip instead it will be better to say that polypeptides were expressed on the chip so this particular column j gives us details about the polypeptide that was expressed and printed on the chip right so that is how you get this adi spot um, spot id which is a unique id for each and every protein what i mean uh, here is that if you go to plasma db id and then if you try to look for duplicates we'll actually find duplicates here because it could be that for the same protein different exon fragments were printed on the chip so you might get duplicates here whereas if you go to your adi spot id you will not find single du any single duplicate because these are unique ids for each and every protein which takes into account the exon fragment which was printed on the chip so that's what you see here if you say for example let's look at this particular row if you say that this was the id and this is exon 1 of 2 you'll actually see the id here and 1 o2 so this becomes your unique id for each and every protein why i'm telling you all this is because this is very important for data analysis for all sometimes you might just start with an analyzing your i column and then you'll figure out later that there are a lot of duplicates and you don't know what you're actually doing so what we need to do is if you want to shortlist any antigens we need to consider the g column for analysis right so now let's move on to the next column which is your description so this we all know this basically describe what was printed on the chip right these are just basically the names of them basically the names of the antigens Now the next column is your organism. So as you know, you have two types of spots here: Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. So basically, this is going to tell you which organism does the antigen belong to. So you have Plasmodium falciparum 3D7 here, for instance, and probably and if, and if you scroll down further, you'll see Plasmodium vivax, Sal1, right? So this is going to give you details of the organism. And then the next column, which is M, is going to talk to you about. the preparation of the spot like for example you have the first few spots are basically your igg mix right so then the preparation is basically your igg mix it's not an ivtt spot now if you scroll down further you'll have same similarly anti human igg 
again you scroll down further you have certain purified proteins which are nothing but our control proteins. So our control spots here were printed as purified proteins and not as IBTT spots. Now if you scroll down further you will find all your other spots basically your antigens which you are trying to study are all printed as IBTT spots. So basically this entire column M gives you details about the spot preparation. Now the all other columns here are basically your patient samples. So if I just move this a little bit, what you see here for example let us consider the first sample. This is basically a positive control which was part of batch 1, set 1, slide 1 and pad 1. So let me again take you back to the experiment. This experiment was performed in 4 sets of 2 batches or rather 2 batches of 4 sets. So you have batch 1, set 1, batch 1, set 2, then you have batch 2, set 1 and batch 2, set 2. So basically what is this telling me? This is telling me that this particular positive control was probed on batch 1, set 1, on slide 1 and pad 1, right? Now similarly, so let us go to the next one which is our real sample that was just a positive control. So this is basically probed on batch 1, set 1, slide 1 and pad 2. So this is going to tell me my position of the sample. So if ever I want to go back to the slides and check the, uh, the real spots, right, the images of the spots, then I know exactly where to go. So for example, if some sample is, beha is not behaving well and I want to go and cross check the intensity of the spots. For example, some sample is giving me very high intensity signals and I want to go back and check whether it is real, then I will know exactly which um, file to open because I have all the details here. So this is for uh, the all other columns. So this is, I hope you have now understood how the excel sheet looks, right. So now what we are going to do, the next thing is we are going to uh, apply a color gradient to this excel, right. And now I will tell you why we are going to apply the color gradient, so let us first do that. So for which what I am going to do? is I am going to go to conditional formatting, I am going to go to, I am going to go to color scales, more rules, and I am going to choose a 3 color scale, and then I am going to choose number type, okay, so I am going to say 0. And I am going to assume that my entire data falls you know in um, between say certain negative values and maybe around 80,000 is my maximum value. So I am just going to assume that if my data falls in this range, I am going to sl split my data ba um, based on 3 numbers, 0 then my midpoint will be say 20,000 and my highest will be 40,000. And I am going to choose some colors here, so I say this is maybe grey. then I am going to keep this black and I am going to keep this red. So what this is going to do is all my values above 40,000 are going to be in dark red and then around 20,000 will be black and the lowest or the least values will be grey and those which are in negatives will be almost white. So that is how I am going to apply a colour gradient here. So you can see in this slide here, basically what I have done is I have just minimised this excel a little bit. So you can, you will be able to see all 4 batches at once. So I do not know if you can see a black line here. So basically this is going to split your batches, um, sorry, uh, in fact it is going to split your set, set 1 from set 2 of the first batch and set 1 uh, from set 2 of the second batch. So basically this is batch 1 set 1, batch 1 set 2, batch 2 set 1 and batch 2 set 2. So when you minimize this excel a little bit and you apply this color gradient, what you can see is that the uh, signal intensities particularly for this batch, um, in fact this whole batch but batch 1 but batch 2 set 1 is really high compared to the rest of the batches. So you will know that mainly from the IgG signals here. So this particular line which you see here are all your, your IgG mix and this particular line which you see here is your anti-human IgG. So basically this is your control which is going to tell you whether you need to rescan your slide or not. So if this is very high, then all your signals by default for um, this particular batch will also be high, right? So that is going to screw up your results a little, uh, screw up your results later, because all the patients in this batch are going to show high signals, which will be, which is, which is not correct. 
So this IgG mix printed on this chip is going to basically help you in deciding whether you need to rescan your slides at different PMT settings and PAR settings, right? So what we'll do here is we will rescan the slides once more, bring these settings down a little bit and bring these settings not as low as this but a little lower because this is also a little high compared to this if you see, right? So later on we realize that this is because of the membrane thickness of the uh, slides. There could be other issues also which you might encounter later. So to avoid this, you need to first bring down the signals and then any changes after that will be corrected by normalization. Okay, so now having rescanned all the slides, uh, as you can see in this slide, um, the settings look pretty uniform though it's still not very uniform and you'll, you'll still feel that batch 2 set 1 has higher signals but overall it's okay because th this will then be taken care of by normalization. So now what we'll do is we'll proceed with normalization uh, using Excel. Now there are two strategies I'm going to talk to you about today. The first strategy is basically a very simple normalization uh, method uh, which we'll use only for visualization. For example, if you want to prepare heat maps, then we will use this uh, the first normalization method. However, if you want to perform statistical tests, then we will use the second kind of normalization which I'll talk to you about. So let's um, first go through um, uh, the first normalization method. So what we're going to do in the first normalization is we're going to su subtract the raw values for each of the IVTT spots from the spe sample specific uh, median value of the no DNA controls. So I'm sure that this is a little confusing. So what we'll do is we will go step by step. First I'm going to show you what raw values are and then I'm going to show you what the no DNA controls are, right? So again we're going to come back to the same Excel. It is color coded and you've, you've, we've reached this stage. You also know that this uh, now in this data we have IgG mix, we have anti-human IgG, we have purified proteins. We don't need any of those right now for our analysis. We are going to directly go down to the IVTT spots. So in fact what we'll do is we'll probably just delete those rows to avoid confusion. So let's start from here. I'm going to delete the first few. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just zoom this a little bit. So I've just zoomed this a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, delete unwanted rows right now. So we don't want IgG mix, we don't want anti-human IgG, we don't want purified proteins right now. Again, let me tell you the purified proteins, basically we don't require in the analysis, but it's important when, for example, your slide has not worked at all and uh, or you've not got uh, the signals you, you required. You can always go back to the positive control spots to see what their signals were, right? So this is basically used for such, um, uh, you know, analysis just as controls. So right now we're going to delete those rows and we're going to only keep rows which are IVTT mix, right? That's what this is. So now we're going to have this way 500 plasmodium falciparum IVTT spots and 515 plasmodium vivax IVTT spots. So we're going to go down, we've deleted unwanted rows. There are a few more rows below which we don't need. So after these 1015 um, spots, there are few more like TTBS, which is nothing but your buffer spot, where only buffer is spotted and then you have some empty spots, data, then we have data for blank. So this is also unwanted, we're going to delete that as well. So now what we have are 1015 IVTT spots and 24 no DNA control spots. So now what are these no DNA control spots? So basically, these spots have the entire IVTT mix except the plasmid. So basically what you expect here is no expression because you don't even have the plasmid here. Whereas the IVTT spots have the entire IVTT machinery, just like no DNA, but they also have the plasmid where you're going to express your gene of interest, whereas you don't have that here. So what is this going to provide? It's going to provide your background signal. So what we're going to, trying to do in the first type of normalization is we are subtracting our raw signals from background. So now there are 24 such spots, which you remember we have rearranged and that's why it's come together, grouped together like this. The first thing you're going to do is take a median of this, which I've already uh, provided you here. So this is the formula for it. I've just done this, the whole thing in Excel. So now we have a median value here. So the first thing what I'm going to do is for this particular sample, which is uh, in, in column N, this is one sample, I'm going to subtract the values for each and every IVTT spot from that particular median, right? So each of these spots which you see here, I'm going to subtract it. And that is what is my median, sample specific median normalization. 
So let's scroll. So probably we'll um, do this in the same Excel. Okay, I have kept place for that here. So this is called IVTT spots minus median of IVTT control. So that's exactly what we have to do. We are going to say is equal to, then we are going to go to that particular spot. So say let's take the first patient and then we say minus and we go to the median value which is 7842. So now because I, I want this row to remain constant throughout, I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of the row. So this is what we get here. And now I'm just going to drag this across as well as down. So once you drag and drop, this is the kind of Excel you get. I've just minimized this. But if you apply your color gradient, this is how it looks overall. So this is what you can use now to make your heat maps. And what I've also done is I've sorted this based on uh, the um, antigens as well as the patients who are um, uh, falciparin positive and vivax positive. I've split them completely. And I've also made another um, Excel sheet based on age. You can also split them based on age. So this is how I have sorted them. So I've put all your PV positive um, patients together and PF positive together. And I've also sorted based on age. So you have PV positive, PF positive, as well as sorted by age. So this way you can sort your Excel in different ways. You can also use other softwares to make your heat map. But basically this kind of, no once you normalize it in this um, way, you do not perform any statistical analysis with this data. For statistical analysis, I'm going to now show you the next uh, uh, normalization method, which is your log to transform fold over control normalization. So for this, I'm not going to show you the entire method again, because now you know how to do it on Excel. I'm sure you all know. For this, I'm only going to show you the steps. Uh, the first thing what we do is we're going to set a floor of 100. So what we're, what we're uh, trying to say here is that all the samples which are below 100 is going to have a value of 100. So this is going to remove all my negative values from my data. So that's the first thing and I've done it here for you. And we're going to keep scrolling, right? The next step what we're going to do is to divide each and every raw value by the median of the IVTT controls, uh, control spots. So just like how we did previously, we subtracted raw, raw values from the median of the IVTT control spots. This time we're going to divide it. So that's what is called fold over control. So once you set a floor of 100, then you divide it. And the next thing you're going to do is to convert this whole data into log values. So you log to transform this entire data, right? And that's why it's called log to fold over control. So once you do this, this data can be used for any statistical analysis. So this because this normalization is known to be more stringent. Okay. So now either you can use programming to do your statistical analysis or you can use different softwares which provide you statistical tests. But what you need to know is which type of test you need to use, which is beyond the scope of this lecture. But you can always read about what you want to uh, uh, do and you can also decide on which software you can you want to uh, you want to use for example graph pad prism is an excellent tool for, for preparing graphs it also helps you in a lot of statistical analysis but if your data is really huge like the one we have is not very huge but uh, still it is not very small for graph pad prism so for example you, you can have uh, graph pad prism can get um, stuck in the middle if you're using data of even this um, size uh, so of course, if you have bigger data sets, then it's very difficult to use software like Graph, GraphPad Prism. However, if you're going to have only 10 patients or 20 patients with 40 proteins or something, GraphPad Prism does offer you a lot of uh, statistical tests. Uh, apart from that, there are other softwares as well. You have MetaboAnalyst, though it is for metabolomics data, you still have a module called Significance Analysis of Microarrays in it, which you can explore for your uh, microarray uh, uh, data analysis. But uh, there are of course, the R programming and Python and other things will definitely be much better for your analysis as you will save a lot of time as well. 
So what I'm going to do towards this, we are coming to the end of the lecture. I'm only going to show you a very small analysis you do on, um, I have done on um, Excel. So basically what my aim here is to identify most uh, zero reactive proteins in my, from my chip, which means that the proteins which elicit the maximum antibody response in malaria patients, right? So that is my aim. So now just to get this whole list of best zero reactive proteins, I, uh, you can also do this on Excel using a particular formula, which I will show you now. So let's go back to the Excel. This is how our Excel was, right? Before we removed all of these rows, which are IgG and anti-human IgG. So I've retained them for now. I'll probably zoom this a little bit. So now if you see that I've retained all the uh, rows, so the first thing what we need to do, of course we don't need this, but I've still retained the entire sheet uh, from the beginning. You will see that there are these four patients which are deliberately kept out of the analysis. For example, there are, uh, so if you see here, there is PF plus PV and everywhere, right? So basically these are my patients who were um, diagnosed with mixed infection. So I don't want any uh, such patients in my analysis. So I'm going to purely have groups which are Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. And I'm going to look at, look for their response um, to Plasmodium falciparum antigens and Plasmodium vivax respectively. So I'm not going to have any of these mixed uh, patients, I've, going to, I've kept them out. So if you want, we can also delete them, right? So we need to basically start from row number 82. That's what we are interested in because these are the IVTT spots. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take an average for each and every spot. So for example, let's write here average. And I'm going to say is equal to so I get an average value and I'm going to just drag this down. So you will have an average value for each and every spot for all the patients. What I missed telling you before is that the previous sheet had many more uh, columns here. That's because they, uh, we had a lot more samples which are probed on the uh, chips. For example, we had positive controls which are nothing but samples from uh, taken from a place uh, which is um, a highly malaria endemic region. So you know that those spots have to give you a signal, right? So those are my positive control samples. So, so don't get confused between positive control samples and positive control spot, they're totally different. So these positive control samples, I've, I've excluded them from this, from this particular analysis. We also had healthy controls, which are basically malaria naive individuals, uh, means patients who were detected, were not detected with malaria at the time of admission. So they were malaria, malaria negative. Those patients were also taken and probed on the chip just to see if there's a difference in response. Uh, such patients have also removed from the analysis. There are also um, certain samples which I have probed uh, repeatedly, in probably in duplicates or four times in all, you know, once in, in all the sets, just to check for reproducibility. So here are some scatter plots you can see. Uh, where I've, I'm showing patient to patient reproducibility. So basically I'm showing reproducibility between my batch runs. So all of these patients also I've removed from the analysis. I have basically now in this Excel 200 patients, um, 100 plasmodium vivax and 96 plasmodium falciparum patients and four which are mixed infection also I've removed. So in this way you can choose to remove rows and columns based on what you want to um, study and you can uh, make your comp uh, Excel less complicated. Right, so, so that's what I had missed mentioning, but now that's done. So I've taken an average right now. Now I'm going to apply this particular formula which you see here. If the average value for a particular spot is more than twice the standard deviation of the mean of the no DNA controls, then that particular spot, then that particular antigen is zero reactive. So what this means is that if this is the average, if this particular number is greater than this particular number, which I'm going to show you right now, if you take an average 
of the mean plus 2 times standard deviation of the no DNA spots. This is my number. So if that raw value or if any raw value is greater than this value, then that spot is basically zero reactive. Then that antigen is sorry, then that antigen is basically zero reactive. So I'm going to say if this is equal to if function this spot is greater than this then 1 else 0. So I get 1 here and what I finally get is an excel sheet like this where I have random 1s and zeros, right. So all of these 1s I am going to now say are my zero reactive proteins because they are greater than twice the standard deviation of my control spots. Now a lot of people may also use healthy controls in their analysis, right, but we do not have them. So what they do is they compare the, uh, the signals, in, signal intensities in a malaria group versus a healthy population. But since we do not have all that, I am going to simply say that this is my these are the list of my zero reactive proteins which I can now take forward for further analysis. So this is not a great, this is not a statistical test, this is only uh, shortlisting my proteins and I'm, I'm here I am only shortlisting my proteins from 1500 to a handful which I can then take forward and study. So this is what that sheet is. Now what I have done here is I have taken this for a group of patients but now what if I want to check this for a particular patient. So that is what is my antibody breadth which you see here. I have done this individually for every single patient. Maybe I will zoom this a little bit. So what you see here is that I have zoomed this for every single patient. So basically the previous one which I showed you was, was the average for a, for, for a single spot for a group of patients as well as the average for the no DNA control. Here I have done it for uh, each patient which means it is sample specific, right. So in this way if I, if I scroll down, what you will get here, this you will, you will know the number of seroreactive antigens per patient which means that if one patient uh, for example here is seroreactive to only 12 antigens whereas there are some other patients which are seroreactive to 77 antigens. So this is basically my antibody breadth. So these are the two basic kind of analysis which I, which I can show you uh, in Excel for now. The power of microarray uh, technology is basically um, the fact that you can perform this experiment very fast probably in a day or two and then using any kind of patient data all you need to do is map this whole data which microarray data to each and every patient uh, clinical information that you have and then you need to, you can perform any kind of statistical analysis and you can generate several results from the same one, uh, single experiment. So that's the beauty of this. I hope you've got a glimpse of um, how to perform data analysis and how and how basic statistics can be done and how this is not the only way to do statistics at all. You can do uh, use softwares and uh, programming and I would still recommend that people do programming because if you want to make even a single small change, you don't have to repeat the entire analysis. Also tomorrow if somebody provides you some other clinical information of the same patient population, you don't have to repeat the analysis in Excel, you can simply write a code for it and then in, in a few minutes you will get results for that as well. So that's all for now, thank you. After going through this demonstration session and the insights of doing microarray based data analysis, you must have realized that there are many ways of analyzing and representing microarray data. Of course there is no single way, no correct way of telling you what is the best way of doing data analysis. There are many considerations you have to keep in mind when you are thinking about how to make meaningful information out of this high throughput data. 
There are several questions that can be answered using microarray data provided your data passes the quality control checks and it is properly normalized. In such experiments, your control features becomes very crucial. Both the positive controls and negative controls, they guide you about how accurate and real your data is. They could distinguish between real signals and background noise after proper analysis methods. In the next class, you will see another application of protein microarrays in a different application where we will shift the gears to the cancer research and also the platforms. So far we have talked about self-free expression based protein microarray platform. We will now talk about how to take purified proteins printed on the chip using human proteome arrays and then apply those to investigate a, a deadly disease cancer and try to talk to you about both experimental demonstrations as well as the theoretical concepts involved in performing such biological experiments. See you in next lecture. Thank you.